uh, the concluding top level dialogue of our event uh, is entitled Next Generation EU and the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, and it features a stellar cast of speakers from the European Parliament. The purpose of this uh, final panel is to connect the debate on the recovery fund with the new initiative to launch a conference on the future of Europe, reflecting on the challenges and the opportunities ahead. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce to you in alphabetical order, Gwendolyn Del Bosco Field, Sandro Godzi, Danuta Hubner, and Domenech Ruiz Devesa. The speaker, uh, who are all highly influential members of the European Parliament uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee, are well known to you all. Uh, but let me emphasize that through their involvement, we are pleased to secure this afternoon one speaker from each of the four main and mainstream EU political groups, as well as speakers representing different states and region of Europe. Uh, let me say just a couple of words on each very briefly. Danuta Hubner, who is a long-standing friend of the Brexit Institute since she spoke at the very first event of the Institute exactly four years ago, uh, is a member from Poland of the uh, EPP, European People's Party. Uh, Gwendolyn Del Bosco Field is a UK-born French member of the European Parliament, where she's the deputy chairwoman of the Greens. Dominic de Veza is instead a member from Spain of the Socialists and Democrats, uh, which he leads on issues of constitutional affairs. And last but not least, uh, Sandro Godzi, who's also a long-term friend of the Institute. He spoke uh, in his capacity then as Minister of EU Affairs of Italy at an event we were running in Rome uh, at the Irish Embassy. Well, he's elected in France uh, with the uh, Renew Group uh, of uh, Renew Europe Group uh, put together by uh, President Macron. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, the EU institutions have agreed in March last month a joint declaration on the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, which is due to kickstart in May next month. Uh, so the timing of this high level debate could hardly be better. And I want to warmly thank Danuta, Gwendolyn, uh, Domenek and Sandro for being with us uh, to discuss this enterprise and present their thoughts uh, and its uh, potential. Before passing on the floor uh, to the first speaker, let me just mention a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, first, let me remind uh, everyone that we are recording the panel and that later there will be the opportunity to ask questions, either by writing them in chat directly to me or by asking for the floor, in which case uh, we will proceed to uh, unmute you. Uh, secondly, let me remind the speakers to please limit their opening remarks to five, seven minutes, as I know they are used to do within the European uh, Parliament, uh, so that we uh, have sufficient time for the debate. Uh, and finally, let me also announce uh, with great pleasure that the President of Ireland, uh, Michael D. Ingins, is following uh, our work this afternoon. So the agreed order of speakers is Dominic first, then Gwendolyn, uh, uh, Sandro and uh, Danuta. So without further ado, I'll pass on the floor straight to uh, Dominic to kick off. Thank you very much uh, to, to the chair of Federico Fabrini <clears throat> and to the Brexit Institute for, for convening this, this meeting. I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues uh, from the Constitutional Affairs Committee, but also friends, uh, Sandra Gozzi, Danuta Hubner, and Wendolyn Belbos Corfield, because um, Federico mentioned we belong to different political families, but all of them pro-European political families, and we in particular um, cooperate and work very uh, closely together for the common goal of uh, further European integration in a, in a federal direction, which I think is more, more current than ever now uh, after Brexit um, and with uh, the pandemic and the conference uh, on the future of Europe. Um, just a word on Brexit. You know uh, probably uh, better uh, the researchers of this institute, the defects in a way, the, the incidents uh, that we have seen in uh, Northern Ireland in the past few days are maybe the, the symbol no? of, uh, of the, um, uh, of the um, you know, of the failure of Brexit, no? um, creating an internal border within the UK, but 
Uh, we only have to look at the economic figures, uh, the desolated state of the Welsh ports that don't work anymore, you know, as the land bridge with France, the exports uh, fall, um, the diminished role of the city of London vis-a-vis -vis Amsterdam and, and others. So I think this is all now in, in plain view that this was a terrible idea. Uh, at the same time, it is interesting to, to note uh, that it had a cohesive effect at the time on the other 27. Uh, um, citizens, institutions, and member states came together to stay in the union and move forward, uh, which was something that probably not many people predicted at the time, but the, all the polls in the Eurobarometer showed how uh, increase to the union and to the, um, and to the euro increased after Brexit. And then uh, the outcome of the European elections, I think was very clear in, in this regard. Um, this is why I think the conference is very timely because in a way, uh, one side uh, benefits, uh, even if we regret, of course, the, the withdrawal of the union of the United Kingdom, is that we know that uh, this uh, member state was uh, always reluctant with further political integration. So we may have a dividend there that we can exploit uh, with the conference. That will be number one. Number two, we have the pandemic. And the pandemic also revealed the need for more Europe. I think this is also very clear. In the field of uh, health policy, it's very clear. Uh, that we need more Europe, that we need a health union. Um, even with the high caps that we had with the, the unfortunate uh, AstraZeneca contract, it's very clear that uh, the overall strategy is the right one. We could only do that as Europeans, not competing among us. And now even the, the vaccination rate in Europe is, is speeding up, as the Financial Times mentioned today. So I think in the end, um, this will look much, much brighter than, than at the current moment or in the past uh, few weeks. And then the recovery plan for Europe is another example in which, uh, you know, the necessity of a common financial approach to um, make available transfers to sectors and member states more, most affected by the pandemic by way of issuing uh, EU debt uh, in a way, mutualizing uh, the risk um, is, is the way forward. So in a way, we have uh, mutualized the, the purchase of the vaccines at the European level, and we have also mutualized at the European level the financing of uh, the recovery. So those are two very important, I will say, um, federal steps. Now, I think that what we need to do now in the conference is to formalize these developments. Uh, we have to give them constitutional nature. That, that, that's for me the main challenge uh, of the conference. Uh, if we look at Article 168 uh, or that provides the basis for action in the health field, we have some room for maneuver there, but it's very limited. For example, uh, harmonization of measures across member states, even uh, for fighting a pandemic, is uh, forbidden. Uh? So this is something that we, we have to take a, a very you know, deep second look. And then the, the recovery plan uh, has uh, two elements that need to be resolved in the conference. One is the legal uncertainty. Of course, for me, the plan is perfectly legal, uh, but as you have seen in Germany with the latest uh, lawsuit uh, in Karlsruhe, not everybody believes the same. And this is because there is some, you know, ambiguity in the treaty as it regards the power to issue debt and as it regards the relationship of issuing debt and the principle of uh, budget balance. So we have uh, an issue there to, to resolve in order to have full legal clarity and avoid, you know, further, you know, litigation around it. And the second, and with this I, I finish, uh, just to, to keep with the time, we, we need to give this plan full democratic uh, legitimacy. Mm -hmm. This is a plan that, uh, as, it, as it is uh, today, uh, in accordance with the Lisbon Treaty, 
the European Parliament plays no role in uh, the decision to issue the debt. This is only in the hands of the Council. Uh, not even uh, the consultation procedure is, is uh, foreseen for Parliament, which is rather uncommon, I will say, because in many other instances in which we don't have decision power, but at least we are consulted. In this case, this is not even the case. And then, uh, of course, um, as you know, the plan foresees the introduction, which is a very good thing, by the way, of pan future pan-European taxes on in different, you know, transnational uh, public bats, let's put it that way, uh, like CO2 and others, uh, in order to pay back the debt. But once again, Parliament uh, plays no real deciding role in the establishment of, which is for me, you know, counterintuitive, of pan-European forms of taxation on transnational cross-border uh, phenomena. So these, these are, I think, the two main challenges that we have from a constitutional perspective uh, to deal with in this uh, conference on the future of Europe. In this regard, I will say it's more timely than ever. Just one final thought. The Congress of The Hague in 1948 came after the, the catastrophe of uh, uh, the Second World War. Now, I will say the conference on the future of Europe comes in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Domenic, and I know you will have to leave us earlier for family obligation, but I'll hand over straight the floor to Gwendolyn to continue the conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it's, uh, uh, quite a lot of things will be in common, of course, because we, we, we have uh, the four members that you have here gathered that have, in fact, the same sort of vision of Europe. But anyway, um, I would say that on both topics, uh, the recovery plan, the next Generation EU and the Conference of Europe. On these both topics, it is quite interesting to put them in parallel for me because I can make basically the same statements, the same analysis and, and point out the same sort of weakness. Um, so first, uh, the good things, um, the very positive aspect on both topics is of course um, that in, in we have sort of an, an idea now of a solidarity of European Union uh, member states, uh, which was lacking uh, after the Greek crisis very much, uh, was very, a very big pity, I think, the, how, how the member states left uh, Greece, but also on the migrant uh, debate, for example, topic, uh, the, the, how a number of member states Mine also, France has left the certain countries. On all of this, we have, we have been lacking solidarity. On, on these recovery plans, there was, in, in a very spontaneous, genuine way, quite incredible, um, there was this solidarity that came up and it, and it followed the same common interest. And in the Conference of Union, we also have this idea of solidarity and this idea of a common interest and of a common future. And we've been lacking this for a number of years. So that's a very good thing. I would say also that, of course, the fact that in both cases, a green, very strong agenda is there, is a very important thing, a very positive. Uh, the fact that we managed in the recovery plan to have these green uh, targets, very strong ones, but also the fact that it has been very clearly said by a number of groups that the climate change and the way of tackling it would be one of the topics we would hope to work on in the Conference of Europe, of the future of Europe. Now, what is the most important things for the Greens, um, val valuable really assets that we managed to get the Parliament in these two, um, in, this, in the same two, in these cases, one of them uh, for the recovery plan is uh, the question of own resources. Dominic said it, I mean, having a budget for European Union is, of course, for the Greens, the first step to having um, a real European meaning, uh, Union that has a meaning. The fact that uh, the, the crisis and the idea of a recovery plan brought up this idea of having your own resources uh, is a very important step. And we hope that in the Conference of Europe, this idea of going again on these own resources and on the budget will be still there. Once again, I've said it already, the green agenda, um, the fact that we go on pursuing this green agenda and we step up more and more the green agenda of European Union, be it for climate change, for energy, for biodiversity, in the recovery plan and, and mostly having these criteria now for the money of Europe, but also in, in the topics we, that will be discussed in the, in the Conference of Europe. And then third thing, very important, of course, is that we have 
uh, for, for, for a few months now, we have left behind the, the big austerity principles and the big idea that the budget balance is the only thing that is important in European Union and that the market is the only thing important. Now we are talking about another Europe on health issues, on green agenda, on a common interest. This is very important. Now the three challenges that we still see is, of course, the implication of everyone in this. You could say it about the recovery plans, uh, the money, it has, it has been shown by my colleague Alexandra Guise very clearly, the money is clearly targeted to employment sectors, nearly only men, employment sectors, women are out of this. Uh, we could say about the, Europe, the Conference of Europe that I'm still concerned about the fact that uh, young people and more generally everyday citizens will find a way to be involved. So the, the question of uh, uh, Europe for everyone is still very much a challenge. The question, of course, of rule of law. Uh, this is a great, great concern. The rule of law has been installed a bit in the, in the recovery plan, but it's still a very uh, a weak um, tool, difficult to, to trigger. So this is a very huge preoccupation today with two member states that are clearly out of rule of law, Hungary and Poland. And then third and last, the question of still, in both cases, still too much state-focused uh, way of doing things. Be it in the Conference of Europe, we, we lost huge months because of a debate on who should be there, who should be the chief and all this. And again, in the recovery plan, they are still very much in the hands of, of the states and not enough um, in, a, in a European discussion debate. And just to, to conclude, um, let's say that, of course, Brexit is on one hand an opportunity because UK was sometimes resisting a number of these uh, 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 developments we could take. At the same time, it is a very big pity that UK is not involved in this future of Europe. And it's even more pity when, once again, two member states are clearly uh, getting a side of, of European Union values at the moment. And we are facing more and more fragmented European Union, European Union on some topics. So uh, I hope that one day England is also part of this global future. Thank you, Gwendolyn, also for that uh, perspective bridge uh, you're trying to uh, launch towards, uh, towards the UK. Let me just take the opportunity to welcome here my president, the rector of WC University, Professor uh, Dara Kyo. I'll hand over straight the floor to our next uh, speaker, uh, Sandro Godzi. Uh, Sandro, it's not as beautiful as Villa Spada uh, with the Irish Embassy to Rome where we last met uh, a few years back, but we are delighted to have you back. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Always, uh, always a good idea to go back to Villa Spada when the sanitary condition will allow that. So, um, and so, I mean, it, uh, it, is a, it is a suggestion that I make to you and to the Institute. Huh? Um, well, I mean, uh, we are, um, in a few days, we will celebrate the 70 years of the Treaty of Paris, uh, which uh, started all basically on the 18th of April, 1951 betting the relaunch and the recovery of Europe after the Second World War on steel and coal. And relying also on a strong support, which at the time didn't come from the European budget, but the, it came from the American budget, it was the Marshall Plan. Uh, 70 years afterward, we are facing uh, the same uh, challenges, not provoked by a, a physical war, but provoked by, a, I mean, a strong fight, let's say, against the global pandemics. And uh, we have to see on what, on what we want to bet uh, uh, about uh, on our future, on our present and our future. And basically we have decided, we have decided to bet uh, our future uh, on the ecological transition and on the digital transformation. Uh, this is the core uh, of the recovery plan. And this is also uh, the part we justify the most. Uh, the um, a title that we use for the whole package, which is Next Generation EU, because there isn't anything is so strongly linked to the current, but especially to the next generation, like the digital transformation and the, um, the ecological transition. Because we are talking about something which is already urgent today, but that uh, pushes us uh, to plan our key choices 
I would say in terms of society, but certainly in terms of uh, industry, of growth, uh, from year to 2050. And this is the, uh, the um, basically the most important point, in my view, uh, of the recovery plan. Our call and steel today are the uh, ecology, environment, and the digital. It is around these two new issues that we have to organize uh, the relaunch. Uh, and, uh, and it is clear that we have also to see this opportunity uh, to prove that uh, our choices uh, were the right one. And what are our innovative choices? I mean, uh, they have already been recalled. Uh, for the first time, we go on the market uh, for a operation of a big scale uh, to get the money to finance the recovery, the recovery plan. It was the first time that we do it at this scale. We go on the market, we um, issue common bonds, uh, we issue a common European debt, uh, because we think that it is only through solidarity that we can uh, get out uh, stronger and better of the crisis. But we also decide to pay back in a new way uh, this common debt and the interest uh, with new resources for Europe. Uh, uh, and this is uh, goes back to what already said. And we know what are the new resources are. Surprise, surprise, they are linked to the key choices of our new coal and steel, because they are referred to a digital tax, to a sort of carbon tax at our border. It is not the exact name, but I mean, we, we understand. About uh, uh, circular economy and uh, plastic and the recycle approach. So, I mean, uh, um, all this, uh, uh, it is temporary so far. All this should end in 2026. But all this can be the ordinary way to run Europe, the ordinary way to run a new economic and social policies in Europe, if we make of this recovery plan a success. And this is why we, we don't have right to failure. And this is why we have also to closely follow what the different member states are going to do with the recovery plan. Because if we prove after this strong negotiation, if we prove that our approach is the right one, if we prove the effectiveness of the recovery plan, it is going to be very difficult to go back to the, to the past, to go back and refuse uh, European common debt uh, 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 as an ordinary way of running Europe to refuse uh, uh, new resources to the European Union. And we have, it will be my last point also, to seize this opportunity to put in question the issue of unanimity. We are talking about common debt, common bonds, uh, resources of the European Union, and we rely for this on ratification of national parliament and on the national let me say, nationalistic attitude of the court of, of the German Constitutional Court, which is teasing us, it's been in teasing us for 20 years, exploiting, exploiting the ambiguities of the treaty to go back and to put in question even the principle of primacy of Euro. So we need to say what is for Europe is decided through European procedure, consent of the European Parliament, and let's clarify the ambiguity, which are subject of manipulation by certain constitutional court, and that could be used this time again to slow down the process, but especially to say we cannot do what we want to do. So uh, the means to try to turn this recovery plan into a permanent, a permanent way. So, I mean, uh, it, this is why the issue of the recovery plan and the issue also of ratification is uh, directly linked also to the Conference of the Future of Europe, where we have to get rid of unanimity, especially on issues which are purely European, such as European resources or European common debt. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sandra, also for mentioning the German Constitutional Court that featured uh, in the conversation we had in the prior panel. Uh, I'll hand straight over to uh, our Last but not least, for speaker Danuta Hubner, who's back again at the Brexit Institute. Danuta, the floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself, Danuta. 
Okay, I usually say the most important thing when I'm still muted. So I just wanted to say that women love to have the last word, so don't worry. And I would like to, first of all, thank you very much indeed for, for invitation, for uh, it's such a pleasure to be back in the Institute and also for having all those initiatives on the different issues and having you from time to time also in AFCO uh, committee. I would like to, uh, to just raise maybe two groups of, of issues. First, I would like to say a few words on uh, preparedness that is taking place in, in my political group, which is EPP in the European uh, Parliament. And then uh, I would like to talk about the populist uh, risks um, for the conference on the future of, um, of Europe. And uh, as you know, in AFCO, we have been for uh, colleagues, uh, I hope would confirm for more than a year, actually, a year, a new year and a half, I think, from the very beginning of this term, working on issues related to the conference on the future of Europe, trying to push forward as well. And we worked on substance through all sorts of papers and discussions and also on the on the process. And uh, uh, But this is also true for political groups. And it was clear also from what colleagues were, were saying. Uh, and also in my uh, political group, uh, we have been involved for quite some time in preparing uh, or trying to prepare, it's not yet finalized, uh, a, a shared paper, shared approach to the both to the conference and also to the issues that we as EPP would like to have addressed during the uh, the conference. And also, you you probably everybody realizes that most likely during the conferences there will be also political caucus, caucuses and uh, political groups at European level and, and Parliament level will continue to to, to be active um, uh, also with the in the uh, discussion. Um, the EPP is, is a group that is historically rooted in the process of European uh, integration. And, and I think that I can be sure and hope I can say that we will do everything to have the conference really a successful uh, conference because I think Europe needs it. Need it. I share the views um, of the colleagues that we start the conference um, in a very difficult time, but also I personally believe uh, that it, it, it is uh, historically the case that the most innovative things are born most often in crisis when the new solutions are being sought uh, by uh, society. And this is, uh, that's why it's a good moment, I think, um, uh, because we, pandemic, I think Dominic was first to say that pandemic showed that people need more Europe. And that's also confirmed by the Eurobarometer uh, studies. And what other colleagues were also saying is that basically, because of pandemic, Europe has, is practically reforming itself through actions and all the new generation EU initiatives, new own resources. This is just really Europe uh, in reforming itself because the, there is a need for those reforms. And that's why I think it's very important moment from that point of view for the conference, but also because people in times like this, people have sort of show high propensity to get involved, to have opinions, to discuss, to reflect, to think of what change we need for the for the future. So we have this luck, I think, as politicians, that, that there is a, um, a civil, uh, that there is a European citizenship, a citizenry um, uh, that is really open to to start finally this uh, discussion. But there is the risk, and the risk is that this under the stress of pandemic, if there is no credible offer uh, on the European table, if we don't also discuss with people, do not show openness to their ideas, then people may turn toward the pseudo solutions proposed by the false prophets of the new Renaissance, uh, like the populist politicians of the ilk of Orban, Salvini, and also pragmatic nationalist prime minister of, um, of Poland. So I think we have to also uh, believe that uh, and do everything uh, we can to see that the proposals that will be just sort of evolving during the discussions, that they are hopeful, that they are at the same time realistic, and they also respond to the expectations. I think it's also an important responsibility for us um, uh, politicians. I also think that uh, the, whatever we will be uh, proposing, discussing, whatever be coming out from our uh, discussions has to be constructive. And, and uh, I think uh, we also need to advance our European project in a very pluralistic way, I would say, that would be welcoming 
the ideas of various stakeholders, including also maybe especially the new um, generation. So I, I see the, the conference as the beginning of a multifaceted intergenerational dialogue on how to move Europe forward post-COVID and uh, in, in the new global uh, context. So if you ask me what will be on the table, for example, of my political group, we already see it. Uh, which doesn't come probably a surprise that we really need a Europe that is providing the protection, also to protection to citizens, but also we need Europe that is providing prosperity, creating conditions for prosperity, including being also socially sensitive in this context. We need Europe of knowledge, of uh, innovation, climate friendly, all this teal and coal that, um, as Sandro said, I, I think we are, we are, are not really many differences. I think we have more accent or priorities, but I think we, we share a lot of issues uh, as, as groups. But what I think is very important is that through those discussions, we will create Europe that will be capable to, to grow up to expectations because expectations will be changing. So we need also certain mechanisms um, of consultation of, uh, of, of more permanent nature uh, that would allow Europe to grow uh, and, and face the new uh, challenges. We are now focusing on these technical issues, platforms is extremely important, but my real worry, and this is just the second part, if you allow me, I hope I will not extend too much, but I think it's very important because I come from Poland and I would like to share it with you because my real worry is that I was, what I was, was already alluding to is that Eurosceptics, I don't like this word because I don't know what it means, uh, but first of all, anti-European populists, they tend to be better mobilized to take advantage of, of any means that are available, for example, the, the platform as well. They can hijack the agenda. I'm not talking about people who think differently. I'm talking about populist politicians that can hijack the agenda and put their uh, anti-European or Eurosceptic message forward in a forceful way that would give this impression that citizens of Europe support their vision. I think this risk is probably underappreciated uh, today. And my home country in this context, but it's not only um, the ground uh, in Warsaw, but also in Budapest, uh, where there is high stake game uh, being played at the moment that can make or break the EU in the near future. So we have to build a common front of the nationalists. Uh, we have the, the one they are building a common front of nationalists like uh, uh, like Orban or, or Salvini and, and uh, uh, Morawiecki just before starting conference. This is a clear sign that the national populist forces want to overtake the political discourse in, in, in Europe. So they are coming to the fore with clear goal of mobilizing part of the European population with very simplistic but we know quite effective nationalist uh, uh, message and we'll use conference as a forum to put this discourse, Eurosceptical, skeptic discourse as a dominating uh, one. So I think that we have to see, and I'm just finishing with this, we have to see that Europe is a conference on Europe, on the future for Europe is not only a place to seek seek pragmatic solutions to this post-pandemic uh, Europe, but also a place where we clearly understand the, the issues at stake, which is the defense of democracy and the defense and strengthening of the foundations of uh, where we have our fundamental values, which are our foundations. So engaging citizen is, in my view, the only way to not allowing those who want to destroy Europe to, to do it. Um, thank you. And thank you, Danuta, very much uh, for your remarks, as well as for raising the issue of the rule of law. This is something we started discussing earlier on this morning in, in the opening panel with uh, members of, of the European courts. That's clearly uh, highly relevant as we move forward. Uh, we now have about 15 minutes for, uh, for question. Uh, before opening up the floor, uh, allow me once again uh, to acknowledge and thank uh, President Michael D. Higgins for being with us uh, this afternoon. It's a great honor for us uh, that he's joining us. And I shall mention, uh, he has also recently published a book 
called Reclaiming the European Street uh, that collects his speeches on Europe uh, in the last uh, four or five years published by Lilliput Press. Uh, so I, I, I think that explains uh, also why he is joining uh, us this afternoon uh, and is interested in the field. Uh, so we, we are, I'm happy to open up for a question. And as I said earlier, um, you can either send this in the chat to me uh, or simply raise your hand uh, and we will unmute you uh, so you can uh, directly uh, speak. I'm looking around to see who would like to break the ice. If not, I can perhaps do it just uh, just to kick off the conversation. And I know I'm abusing my role here, but I'm very interested, of course, in all this. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation. So I'd be interested in asking the, the three panelists we have with us, uh, Gwendolyn, Danuta, and Sandro, on what is your views on this strong emphasis uh, for participatory democracy that is in the joint declaration? Uh, do you see a risk that overemphasizing that element might be a way to water down uh, the prospect of institutional reforms? But at the same time, is there something positive we can learn from experiences of participatory democracy? For instance, uh, in Ireland, uh, where recently the constitution was changed uh, through a citizen assembly uh, on the important issue of, of abortion. Uh, perhaps you have some thoughts to share with us and I'll be collecting questions in the meanwhile. Mm. Gwendolyn, do you want to kick off? Yes, thanks. Um, yes, no, we, the Greens have a very positive uh, vision of the implication of citizens. We don't think it is watering down. Uh, we think it will empower also Europe because it will give um, the opportunity to citizens to really care about Europe and discuss about Europe. I think we, when indeed, when we um, worked uh, on, on the preparation of the Conference of Europe, the, the Greens uh, involved in AFCO, we met with representatives of the people working on this sort of referendum in, in, in Ireland, uh, in Baden-Württemberg, and of course also those people that worked on the, on the Citizen Convention on Climate and France. And um, what we got through these three examples is that every time the implication of people means that then they, they care about the topic and they care about the, the democracy too, so that it's never watering down. It's in fact reinforcing the European feeling and the European citizenship um, uh, interest if we, if we do involve them. And it also shows that um, they come with, with practical answers, they come with priorities, they know how to discuss, we shouldn't take citizens for stupid people, they can really very much be involved if they are given the tools. The, the issue is, is, of course, how we manage to get them involved. First thing is, of course, the money, it has, um, it has a cost. Um, and um, and I, I think that what France showed is that um, if you put the money, you have a meaningful process. Macron, uh, and I'm very much a criticist of Macron, but on this, I think he did a very good job. And I think that he really created a convention that was meaningful and, and did what was needed for the citizen to be empowered. So that's one thing, the cost of it. And then, of course, this pandemic situation is also not helping at the moment because not everything can be do remotely. We need to do things remotely so that we engage the most possible people. But there's also the problem of at the moment we need people to really meet and debate. Um, so this is a real question in this pandemic situation. But on on very much on the contrary, we we do not fear the citizens' involvement in parallel with the legislative process and the very much meaningful uh, implication of the parliament also. It is not about replacing parliament with democratic representation uh, by a citizen representation. It is to per process in parallel. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Sandro, do you want to follow up? Yes, uh, I, I will uh, follow up from the last words of Gwendolyn. I agree uh, with what she says. I also agree with uh, her support for President Macron. Uh, thank you, Gwendolyn. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> very, very nice to hear. Uh, I do believe that uh, we, um, our duty, or at least our commitment as a member of the European Parliament, uh, 
should be to make the most of this uh, fine, uh, I mean, of this uh, consensus around the citizen participation to show that uh, a direct democratic participation uh, can nurture, can revitalize, can help. It, it is in synergy also with democratic representation. Uh, and I do believe that uh, the more we are effective in ensuring that uh, citizens act, are heard, are listened to, and we give a follow up to their main request, uh, the more we help also the legitimacy of, uh, um, of um, representative democracy. What I mean that I do, be, no, do not believe that uh, direct participation and parliament are in competition or even worse are in conflict, but they are uh, complementary. And today in 2021, uh, to really give a, a um, complete answer uh, to the issue, a comprehensive answer uh, to this question, how we uh, strengthen democratic, democratic legitimacy and participation, we have uh, to improve the way we work in the parliament and in parallel, we have to favor a new form of citizen participation. The challenge, it will be my last point, the challenge will be, I mean, to make the best, uh, to, to, to set the right rules in the conference, to ensure that the conference is really fit for the purpose, Okay, and then where are I in the conference? The moment we, the difficult point is how we will give a, a follow up, how we will issue a follow up to the main citizen request, and we will be judged on that. And that is going to be a very difficult and important challenge for us and for a certain idea of European democracy. Thank you, Sandro Januta. I, I actually share everything that colleagues were, were saying, so I will not repeat it, but I, I think that for us, for me, the, the conference is also important because it is for us, after the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which created the community of citizens, uh, in addition to community of states, uh, that we uh, have a chance now to open a, a real democratic uh, space uh, for citizens' engagement, and that there will be uh, what we never managed to do. I think there will be a, a sort of stronger push towards this bottom-up uh, Europe, which I think is important and has nothing to, to, to do with the threat to the representative democracy as some of the uh, colleagues even in European Parliament might, might see it. So I think that we, we just we cannot forget that all the treaties and the just gradual sort of incorporation into the treaties, the citizenship of, of Europe uh, and the European Citizens Initiative, we have been making efforts, but we were not very successful. I mean, the European Citizens Initiative, we, we know in the European Parliament that it practically functions to a very, very limited extent only. So there's clearly a a, a need to follow um, on this issue of uh, facilitating the involvement of those citizens who want uh, to participate in decision making to facilitate also now and the conference is a good beginning I think for this uh, process and, and secondly also as I was trying to say in my introduction this is the time of sort of of, uh, of people opening their eyes and then just seeing that there are things that they can influence or that they have expectations that not politicians are not aware of them or so this is also like uh, we, we are coming out reaching out to citizens who are different citizens of 21st uh, uh, century ready to involve ready to engage and also having tools that my generation didn't have or even 10 years ago the generation didn't have those tools state-of-the-art tools to communicate so we have i think huge opportunity to create something uh, something new and uh, the kind of mechanism that would allow uh, citizens uh, to get involved in um, using the newest technology. So I, I, I think we, we are really all open to, 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 to just find an agreement uh, together with the, with the people involved to see how they would like to be engaged as well, because we don't know much about that either. So we have to listen also to them and, and uh, have an idea somehow together. I, I think uh, I put on the table. But can I ask you also a, a, ask a question as well? Because I was, I'm sure I had having meetings, online meetings with citizens in my home country, where I tell them about the um, the conference and the, 
they are sort of waiting for the government government to tell them how they can get involved. So I think we lack this levels of involvement, maybe of think tanks, of institutions, of European Committee or Parliament, Commission and Parliament representations, individual um, politicians, just to, to, to start sort of getting people involved, because there is a sort of uh, waking, waiting for, the, uh, for somebody to tell them where to call, where to go, uh, how to be involved. Do you do anything uh, uh, in, in, as the Institute also on those things? Do you, can you just get involved in, in waking up also the, the, the uh, research community? Because there will be also discussions between researchers and uh, scientists on the future of Europe. It's not only talking to, to politicians and the young people, but also uh, this, do you see any mobilization or any chance uh, uh, for, for this uh, also process to, to take place? I don't know, because Ireland is famous for its SMBs, but uh, are you just doing something now? Well, thanks for, thanks for that question, Danuta. Uh, the, my sense is that every state uh, is, is somehow finding a different way to do it. Uh, in Ireland, for sure, uh, you, the European movement, uh, Ireland, and I know Noel O'Connell is with us uh, this afternoon, uh, is playing a big role together with the Department of Foreign Affairs in organizing uh, the, um, the citizen panels uh, of, of the meeting. I don't know, I see Noel, you're switching your camera on if you want to step in and say more, you're more welcome to do so. Uh, the Brexit Institute has been active on this. We've already organized a couple of events already in 2020 with the Minister of European Affairs and we're certainly very happy to uh, give our contribution from an academic perspective, but I suppose it still remains uh, to be seen exactly what the conference is, uh, is designed to be, uh, and uh, I think that makes it interesting. Uh, Don Noel, if you want to jump in and add anything, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll probably have to unmute you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Danuta. Um, yes, no, no, very briefly, um, and Danuta, thank you. In Ireland, we have a very strong uh, and very proud reputation of our uh, participatory democracy and how we, we discuss and debate the whole process on the Conference of the Future of Europe, from the Citizens' Assembly, on the constitutional matters, to the future of Europe that the Irish government led on through the, the Department of Foreign Affairs um, in the previous iteration in what we're calling phase one. And now in phase two, um, we look forward very much to working with uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and rolling out um, an online uh, digital town hall type debate uh, for citizens to get involved and to have their say on the whole conference on the future of Europe process. But I do share um, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a so somewhat of a sense of frustration in terms of the uh, the slow pace, perhaps in setting out the the guidelines, which which have now uh, seen greater clarity coming from uh, the institutions and the roadmap, and hopefully with the formal launch in May. So until that kicks off properly, we are in the background preparing, preparing and getting the structures and the systems in place here in Ireland and. We, of course, look forward to talking uh, with Federico and all his colleagues in the Brexit Institute, with other um, academics, with civil society groups, with, but also we want to broaden it to not just the usual suspects and deal with um, youth groups, with civil society organisations, with the marginalised, with the underrepresented, um, so as to ensure as national a representation as possible and also to reach out to the Irish diaspora and our overseas community and bring that shared experience and those shared insights uh, to, to bear and really input that into the future of Europe uh, process. I'm also Vice President of European Movement International and obviously as you know Danuta, European Movement International is one of the civil society actors in this regard and a huge amount of work is taking place across uh, Europe, across the different EU member states on this process. But there is a little bit of um, impatience to get the whole process up and running. And hopefully when it is formally launched in Europe Week, that will drive the impetus um, of the whole process. And I think, um, and I think from our perspective here, from an Irish perspective, obviously uh, the, the Irish government are very keen 
to roll this out and are very much to the fore of um, supporting initiatives that get citizens across the whole island involved. And obviously from an Irish perspective, it's also important to uh, facilitate the voices of those in the north who, who consider themselves Irish, who are your, you know, who consider themselves, who have that right to EU citizenship. And how do we have an inclusive um, dialogue that really shapes and influences and brings the Irish perspective to bear on the wider future of Europe process and to ensure that it is uh, bottom led, it is participatory, it is inclusive, and it is um, comprehensive and constructive and leads to a fairer, um, more inclusive European Union that works for all. Thank you, Federico. Uh, thank you, Noel. And uh, I'm glad you actually mentioned both the Irish government and the North. And I should acknowledge that Bertie Iron, the former Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, is also with us this afternoon. He was obviously very active over the weekend for the 23rd anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, including with an op-ed on the Irish Times. So thanks, Bertie, uh, for, uh, for joining us. Flavio Brugnoli, the uh, director of the Center for the Studies of Federalism, has been uh, waiting diligently for a while to ask a question. So I'll hand him the floor. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Federico, and thank you to the Brexit Institute and to the MEPs for this excellent debate. I have a naive question, uh, very simple. Um, do, they have, do you have any idea on how to uh, overcome the need of uh, uh, member states' uh, unanimity in order to, to achieve the uh, qualified, the generalized adoption of the uh, qualified majority voting? Because that, that's a big problem, in my opinion. Uh, I, I refer, for example, to the, the paper of the 12... Uh, uh, countries which are very, say, prudent, to put it mildly, on the uh, conference on the future of Europe. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Um, sh shall we go in reverse order this time? Perhaps, Danuta, you want to start? You, are, you need to unmute yourself. I just wanted to say we have an expert among ourselves, and Sandro has just, uh, I think, has been a the guy on, on, on this, so probably you should listen to him. I, I know that Gwendolyn has to leave while well, she, she left, so Sandro, it's yeah. you so and Sandra, I think you're, yeah. you're finishing that. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I'm working, uh, I'm working on this uh, in the Constitutional Affairs Committee on the issue of unanimity. And uh, my answer is, uh, is built up on, on, different, uh, on different parts, of course, Flavio. Because the first is that we have uh, to uh, renew our effort uh, to exploit uh, all uh, uh, the different clauses uh, in the treaty which allow us to extend uh, the qualified majority voting. We have uh, to uh, re-put on the table this question. Uh, it's the pastoral clause, uh, it's the uh, enhanced cooperation and flexibility clause. And this is the first point. Uh, uh, this, the second point is to put the issue of enhanced cooperation into a more strategic context. So far, it has been only used as a last resort in difficult specific negotiation. Think of, think of the European patent, of the, of, things of the European public prosecutor. I do believe that uh, we should put it uh, in a uh, more strategic, wider context, where a group of people and countries which decide to promote a project of ever closer union within the general European project should, should go ahead, should be allowed to go ahead uh, without obliging everybody to follow, but without accepting that anybody can block. It is a, 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 democ a Europe of free democratic, democratic will. The third point is the conference on the future of the Union. It is clear that, in my view, it is very likely uh, that if you want to ensure a follow-up uh, to some requests which will emerge from the conference, we will have to modify the treaty. And uh, in that point, uh, we have to do, in my view, uh, two things. The first uh, is to see what we can do to improve and to, I mean, to make uh, the use of these clauses, enhanced cooperation, pastoral, etc., much easier. Huh? First point. 
Second point, what do we do if after the conference, after a long negotiation, we go uh, uh, to, uh, to ask for the approval uh, within the different member states, be it with the referendum, be it uh, with the parliamentary ratification, and then there is one or two countries or three countries which after all, they say no. We reject this. And that, I mean, uh, we are working also with Federico, by the way. In my view, we should say we go ahead on the model of the fiscal compact. We take the content of the reform, we do an international treaty with the willing countries, and we go ahead uh, with the willing country using the method of the fiscal compact, but for um, an integrationist, integrationist and democratic purposes. This is uh, uh, what we are working on and what I am proposing uh, to the Constitutional Affairs Committee. Can, can I just... I, I have to leave you. Danuta, you want to follow okay. up very quickly? No, I, 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 I would just make it more general because I think we, we, we might... Uh, we, we have in the current joint declaration, we, find we don't have the, the ban on the treaty change, which was, I think, a big success because you remember probably the first version of, from the Council was that it's not nothing to do with the treaty change. So this taboo, I think, is the most important thing. And my hope is that if we are doing the whole conference smartly, then we can 45 through, 45 through this conference a strong current of pro-European, pro-democratic public opinion. Because politicians, member states that are totally in favor of expanding the um, unanimity, uh, they will never accept the, the moving away from unanimity uh, unless there is a strong pressure coming from the public opinion. And that's why this conference is for us also, also, also the chance to, to, to just trying to say fortify this, this current of the pro-European pro-democratic public opinion and that's why I was ask, asking you this question because that's why it's so important that we have people not to replace the representative democracy but just really to have really pressure coming from from the people to, uh, with regard to the changes that we need including the unanimity. Thank you very much Danuta to you for raising the point also for uh, connecting with the argument about the political compact we had in the AFCO committee a few weeks back. Uh, we have unfortunately uh, reached the end of our uh, time slot, so I want to hand the floor uh, to my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Dara Kyo, the president of DCU, uh, for some uh, final remarks. And let me thank again all the speakers and all the participants for a great day. Dara, the floor is all yours. Uh, 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 grazie Federico. Uhtran Heron, Karj Galer, Falcha Rovinuga, DCU. Um, a president of Ireland, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, you're very welcome to DCU this afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not here in person. Uh, I'm sitting in my office, you can see the beautiful lawn outside in, uh, in the, one of the oldest parts of the building, uh, Albert College, named for Prince Albert, uh, who was, of course, the father of many, uh, many, uh, many Europeans and a, a European figure, also deeply interested in uh, agriculture, ecology and future. So it is an, an appropriate place in that sense, a historic place. Uh, and I am very conscious uh, today that we, we are sitting in a, in a historic, at a historic point where the onus is on all of us to create uh, the future. Um, if there are any kind of silver linings in the pandemic, I think one of them is the use of the technology and the affordances of that to bring together a global audience uh, as we have assembled today, that the platform has provided for the democratic participation as we see around the room, but also from a sustainable perspective in that we don't need to be together, uh, physically to be together uh, in this dialogue. So I'm pleased to see people from across the continent, from the United States, from the United Kingdom and here in Ireland, of course. Um, this was an exciting uh, day by any accounts and the afternoon was particularly dynamic. Uh, I'm very grateful to all our contributors and the participants for your perspectives. I'm hugely honored that uh, His Excellency, the President of Ireland, um, Michael de Higgins has joined us uh, today. Uh, he's a great uh, friend of the University and of the Brexit Institute and his participation I think reflects, as Federico said, his, his profound interest in things European but more than that in concepts of uh, ideas and um, citizenship 
And I think that that's a kind of a common theme for us today. I'm very pleased too that Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni was with us this morning uh, and I'm delighted too that his uh, introduction has been recorded and I hope Federico and our colleagues in the Institute will make that available. Um, today is an important event. Um, it's, it's really um, about kind of uh, citizenship, an opportunity for all of us to discuss the kind of Europe that we want. And it is to an affirmation of the work of the Brexit, the Brexit Institute, not merely in terms of discovering Brexit as a, as a negative in terms of withdrawal, but looking forward. And I know that that is one of Federico's passion. I'm delighted as well that we had such a dynamic um, discussion between our four M MEPs who joined us for this final session discussing Next Generation EU, the Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, as Federico said, Gwendolyn, Danut, Dominic and Sandro are friends and have contributed before, so it's wonderful to see them here. But also, as he said, Bertie Ahern, uh, former Taoiseach, with us. And I'm delighted especially to see students. Um, we are a, a university all uh, first, first and foremost. But I think that what was clear about this afternoon is the, the passion of the participations of the member of the parliament. That, they, that passion, I think, reflected that sense, and I say this as a historian, that sense of being at, at a, a milestone or a stepping stone, that we are at a particular moment in history, I think, as Danuta said, when we can decide the kind of Europe that we want. That, that is important. And institutes like this and universities providing an opportunity for us to decide where, where we are going. In, in the context of the pandemic, so many people have contributed about this as a turning point or tipping point. People like President Obama, Pope Francis were even about creating the post-COVID world, not as it was in terms of restoration. Uh, this is not a, a Vienna uh, type situation, but what we are looking at now is kind of building a new order, a world as it should be and a world as it could be. And discussions like today facilitate that. Uh, these discussions reflect the values of our university. We are uh, a university that puts people first. Um, we are committed to transforming lives and societies. That is our mission, to transform lives and societies, to address the challenges that face our citizens, uh, to address the challenges of the continent and of the world. An example, for instance, our participation in the European University Projects uh, and our ECU Consortium, which is engaged in creating challenge-based learning opportunities to, to the advance kind of European learners of the future. We are first and foremost a public university dedicated to the public good. And the Brexit Institute is an important instrument of the mission of the university. Uh, and I'd like to commend the Institute, the members of the Institute and its director, uh, Federico, for their work in exploring European challenges, for moving, as I say, beyond withdrawal to the creation of a new Europe. Um, an example of that activity, for instance, the Jean Monnet Network Bridge Project, which is researching a whole host of European projects and challenges. Um, again, Europe is challenged uh, by COVID and the challenges of Europe are exacerbated by COVID. That we, it has demonstrated, the pandemic has cast into, uh, into the limelight the social inequality across our continent. It has increased the disconnect felt by many citizens um, from the European Union itself and democratic institutes, which uh, some of the members uh, of the parliament uh, identified. Um, it, it is a time clearly then for new approaches and new thinking. Within five kilometers uh, of my home here on the university, there's the, uh, the Irish Sea and Dublin Port in Clontarf on the seawall there, there's graffiti in one of the changing spaces and sprayed on the wall after the plague came the Renaissance. Um, and let's, let's hope that this, that this is so, uh, as together we work to build a, a new world with new approaches and new thinking. I hope that today's event and others like it will, um, will be part of that uh, Renaissance. And finally, I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors for their support. Thanks to colleagues from the Jean Monnet Project uh, Relay for co-organizing co today's event. So many thanks. And thanks to the Brexit Institute sponsors, um, Grant Thornton, GSK Stockman in Luxembourg, 
and uh, Allied Irish Banks here in Dublin, who last week extended their sponsorship to the Brexit Institute for a further uh, three years. In that Renaissance metaphor, these are the, the patrons who facilitate this great work. So many thanks to them. But above all, I'd like to thank uh, all our participants today for your commitment and your engagement and your passion in the promise of a new Europe. So thank you very much.